I'd like to thank you all for your generous offering. Surely it will be used for the upbuilding of God's kingdom. And Brother Jim said, make sure that I announce that, uh, uh, that tonight or this evening at four o'clock, as the youth gets together, we will have service here at four o'clock also for the adults to come to bring the kids. Uh, maybe at four o'clock this evening. We've changed our time to try to get more kids coming in that has other uh, other requirements they have to be at for later time that we had been doing this. So hopefully get more people in here. Now before Brother Dan, I've got about two minutes. And Dan sort of looks at the clock a little bit. Twenty kilo, it's about time to turn it over to him. But I want to read just a little bit. It's the Lord's time anyways, if he has to go over just a little bit. But I had something I wanted to read here this morning, chapter 6 of Romans. I'll just read two or three verses here. Verse 16, it says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield your servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. 17 it says, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, that ye have obeyed from that from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. As Paul was writing to the Romans here, he evidently doing like I'm doing today. I'm looking back at the congregation, and most of you all have been in that sinful state at one time. But now you may do a little sin but you don't live in it. Now, I think we talked about that a little bit at Sunday school this morning, is that we don't dwell in that. Satan's going to hit us. He is going to knock our feet out from under us at times. But we don't live in that. If you haven't given your uh, life to the Lord and live for Him, then I beg and plead that you do that. What time you still have time and opportunity. And I think the Bible says, today is the day of salvation. When you know to do what, you need to be, what needs to be done, that's the time to get it done. And I want to go down in verse 23, and it says, For the wages of sin is death. But now listen to this. But the gift of God is eternal life, not just of ourselves, but through, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Only way it can be gotten is through Jesus Christ, the one that we took of those sacred emblems a few minutes ago. He paved the way for us. He made a way for us. He opened the door for us. But when he stands there and knocks, we have to open and let him come in. I'm going to read that verse one more time. If you're still in the sinful state, or whether you've already got the gift. It says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Brother Dan, come bring the message. Thank you, Brother Joe. I'd like to thank the Lord for this another opportunity to be able to share His Word with my friends and loved ones. Uh, I don't like to get started on this, but I'd like to say glad to see uh, Aaron and his family here today. Uh, glad to have you with us. Um, I hope uh, I don't mean to leave anybody out. Everybody else is here pretty regularly, and, and uh, appreciate and love each one of you too. Um, go ahead and turn to page 666 in your songbook. That will be our song of invitation. Uh, as Brother Joe was was saying, today's the day of salvation. Uh, if there's anybody here that's not a Christian during this closing song, if you want to give your life to the Lord, you need to hear the Word. And after you've heard the Word and have, have some understanding of it, um, you need to uh, repent. And uh, once you've repented, repenting is, is uh, well, you have to believe first, but once you believe, you, you need to repent. Uh, repentance is, is turning your life around. Uh, making a commitment to the Lord to, to turn from the life you're now living to a life of following Him and putting Him first in everything. That's repentance. That's a promise you're making to the Lord. And after you've repented during this closing song, if you'd like to come forward, we'll give you the opportunity to confess Jesus Christ before man and be baptized into Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Uh, and then we have a, a place right here where you can work and continue faithfully in the Lord. Uh, and that's that's something. Also, if, if if you are a Christian but don't have a 
church that you call home right now, a congregation. We invite you to, to join here. That's nothing magical about it. It's just a place to do your work for the Lord and, and to live your life for Him. Uh, today I want to, um, to look at, at some of the parables of Jesus Christ. And we think about parables, and, and I think most of us have in our head, you know, the idea that, well, it's, it's like a, a story or something about something that is familiar to us that we would understand, and it lays alongside of this gospel truth that, that we need to understand. It makes it easier to understand. And it does, but that's not why Jesus was, was giving parables. That's not why he spoke in parables. Uh, it was actually a totally different reason. We'll, we'll get to it here uh, in, the, in the scriptures today. But uh, for us, a parable on, um, in search of the Lord's way today on, on uh, TV, uh, Brother Phil uh, told, the, told about the prodigal son. Now, the term prodigal is not actually even used in the scriptures. But we all know what the prodigal son is. We understand it. And we've heard it enough that we understand that, that what it's telling us is that the Father is always there for us with open arms. He's always ready to accept us. And we know that. No matter what we've done in this life, no matter how sinful we've been, the Lord is always there with outstretched arms wanting us to, to come to Him or, or to return to Him. We understand that. But now, think of the, it's in Matthew 14, or Luke 14, rather. If you were to tell that parable to somebody who's never heard of Jesus Christ, doesn't know anything about God the Father, or doesn't care, maybe they grew up knowing something about the Father, which would have been the case with many that Jesus preached to, but they never lived it. What would you get from that parable, the prodigal son? Probably not much at all. But we've heard it over and over again, and the more we hear it, you know, the more familiar it becomes, and we've got a good grasp of it. We've heard it, and we've been, it's been explained to us. I want to go to Matthew chapter 13 today and look at uh, some of Jesus' parables. Verse 1, it says, The same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside. So he was in a home, but he, he left that and went out by the seaside. And it says, And great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. So he went out into a ship. I kind of look at this as like maybe kind of an amphitheater type thing. All these people around the seashore while he's out on the ship preaching to them. And it says, and he spake many things unto them in parables. I'm going to go to uh, the second parable in this chapter in uh, Matthew 13 beginning in verse 24. It says, another parable put he forth unto them. The first parable was the parable. Now my Bible's got a heading that says seed parable. Well, it's, it's a parable of the soils. That's what it's about. The seed was the same in that for everybody, but the soils were different. Those, the acceptance of the seed was different. Uh, this other parable, it says, The kingdom of heaven is like unto, unto a man which sowed good seeds in his field. Now I know a lot of you have done a lot of gardening, farmers and everything else we've got here. You don't go out and get lousy seed for your own field. You get the best you can find. And that's what he did. He took the best seed he could find. He, he, it was good seed, and he sowed it in his field. It says, but while men slept, and this in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, we, we read about how people like to do things under the cover of darkness when people are sleeping. While men slept, his enemies came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. A tear is, is uh, actually, I've read where it's actually a type of wheat, but it's, it's a black seed, and it's, it's not much count, but it looks an awful lot like wheat. They just, they look the same. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, 
Then appeared the tares also. So now it's starting to produce a little bit of fruit. And it says, So the servants of the house keep, householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in the field from whence then hath it tares? There is some difference, clearly. Some people were able to look at it and say, well, some of these are tares. What are they doing in here? Why are they here? He said unto them, an enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? Do you want us to go get the tares out of the wheat, go through there and pick all the tares out and let the wheat continue to grow? Not everybody could tell them apart that easily. They looked a lot alike. It would be real easy to pull up the wrong thing, and they didn't want to pull up any of the wheat. But he said, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. But let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles and burn them but gather the wheat into my barn. At this time, and if, if you notice up in, uh, in, verse, in verse 26, it said it brought, it brought forth fruit. They were known by their fruit. It's the same with people today. We are known by our fruit. But here, if they gathered up the, the tares at, when it's time for harvest, if some of the wheat came up with it, it could still be separated out. It was time for the harvest. The wheat was ready to go. So they took the, the tares and they put them in bundles and burnt them and put the wheat in the barn. Then it goes right into another parable. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. Mustard seed is one, if, if I had one here in my fingers, you wouldn't know. Except you probably saw me just go like this, so you know I don't. But it's that small. You couldn't see it. Which indeed is the least of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs, and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. A mustard seed different varieties. There's, there's varieties of mustard seeds that you can plant and it'll grow about 10 feet tall. And it will have enough limbs for birds to be able to, to, to nest in and to land in. And that's what the kingdom of heaven is like. That's what the said in verse 31. He compared this to the kingdom of heaven. The Lord's kingdom started out in Jerusalem. It said 3,000 gave their lives to the Lord. They heard the word, they believed, and they were baptized. And then a couple chapters later in the book of Acts, we find that 4,000 gave their lives to the Lord. A couple chapters later, five more, and they were beginning to multiply. There were more and more all the time that kept giving their lives to the Lord, and it continued to grow. You know, and today we often look at, look at, so how, come, how come the, Churches are shrinking. How come the people aren't growing? How come it's, 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 it's going the wrong direction? The kingdom will continue to grow if we continue to sow the seeds, if we continue to go out and tell other people about the Lord. The Great Commission was that the Word should be preached to all creatures and all nations. And that has done, that has been done, beginning in Jerusalem and, and going on throughout the world. And uh, actually, I had this for a little bit later, if I can remember where it's at. Uh, Colossians 1, 5 and 6 says, For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you, as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit, as it doth also in you, since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. And in verse 23 in, in Colossians 1, it says, If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, 
which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. It has been preached throughout the whole world. It's already happened. Yet there's people today say, well, the Lord won't come yet because it has to be preached to the whole world first. It's happened. And people have let it down. People have stopped caring. People have stopped spreading the word. It's not God. God is there for us. He is always there for us. The next parable says, uh, He spake unto them, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, till the whole was leavened. And that's the leaven that, that goes in throughout the, we think of yeast going through the wheat and, and affecting all of the leaven, all of the, or all of the wheat, or the meal it speaks of here. Again, this has been done. And another verse to, to show that in Romans 10, verse 18. Paul writes here, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is... I'm sorry, chapter 10, verse, verse 18. Let's read verse 10. But I say, have ye not heard? Yes, verily. Their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. Again, the leaven has made its way. It's gone throughout the whole world. All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them. When Jesus spoke to the multitudes, he spoke in parables. He didn't, he didn't explain these parables to them. Back in verse 10, it says, And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but unto them it is not given. They didn't pay any attention under the Old Testament. They didn't care about God at that time. So now Jesus is speaking to them in, in parables. Parable for them was something that they had to sit and think about and meditate on to try to get some understanding out of it. And you know, the disciples didn't even understand all the, all the uh, parables uh, back there in the first part with the parable of the soils. Jesus explained that to the disciples. And now we see here coming up in uh, verse 35, um, well, he explains a little bit further here that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. These are things people wouldn't open their ears to. They wouldn't open their eyes. They didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to pay any attention to it. They had better things to do. Verse 36 said, Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He's going back a couple. They didn't understand that. What is this parable of the tares? He answered and said unto them, he that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. He's the one that sows the good seed. That good seed being, being the Word of God. The field is the world. The entire world. That's where the seed was sown. The good seed or the production of the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The good seed grows into children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The false teachings, the, the things contrary to gospel, those things produce children of the wicked one. 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 11, beginning with verse 13. It says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. There are people that preach Jesus Christ falsely. People that are preaching things contrary to what the scriptures say. Romans 16, beginning with verse 17, it says, Now I beseech you, brethren, 
Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not the Lord Jesus Christ but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple, for the ones that aren't really paying any attention, the ones that really aren't opening their ears and their eyes to the truth. You know, each one of us is responsible for our own salvation. I can stand up here and I can, I can nail the truths of the gospel over and over and everybody hears it and everybody takes it in and everybody follows it and believes it and everybody's saved. But now if I stray from the scriptures, you need to know it. If I stray from the scriptures, I have to answer for that. It's going to be my eternal destination. It's going to suffer. But if you follow what I say, don't look it up and just accept it. You'll be losing your salvation as well. It's one of the reasons I think this is such an awesome responsibility. It's not my just, just my salvation. When I stand up here and preach the Word of God, i got to get it right. Not just for me, but for everybody. In verse 36, then Jesus sent the multitude away. He went back into the house and, and he is telling them now about the, uh, the parable of the tares. In uh, verse 39, he said, the enemy that sowed them is the devil. There's no doubt about it. The devil walks around to and fro seeking whom he may devour like a roaring lion. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. In uh, Revelation 14, I, I want to read uh, several verses here. I'll, I'll try to get through it kind of quick. And I looked, beginning with verse 14 in uh, Revelation 14, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. The harvest is ready. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And we go to be with the Lord in the clouds, we're told in Thessalonians. And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth. For her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city. And blood came out of the winepress even unto the horse bridles. Up to the bridles of the horses was the blood that came out from that winepress. Even unto the horses' bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. There's only two places that anybody's going to spend eternity on. Heaven or hell. Verse 40 says, As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be at the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of the kingdom all things that offend and them that do iniquity. And shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. If people are wailing and gnashing their teeth, they know what's going on. There's going to be consciousness at that point in time. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in a field. The which when a man hath found, he hideth. And for joy 
thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath and buyeth that field. It's, it's a treasure. Salvation is our treasure. When you understand what salvation is and how important it is, we should do everything we can to purchase that or to have it. Jesus has already paid the price. But we need to do everything we can to understand how to accept that. We find out through the gospel. That's how we buy the field. By going into the gospel and learning what the word of God says. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. He's seeking the pearls. He's not just sitting there hoping one will drop on him someday. Like people do with, with the lottery and things like that nowadays. He's out seeking it. He's going for it. Who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had to buy it. He gave up everything for it. We should be willing to give up everything for our eternal destination. We need to be prepared to live our life here in this wor world so that we'll enter into heaven when the Lord returns. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind. You know, if you cast a net into the sea, it, it goes down underneath the sea and you really don't see what gets into it, do you? the same when you spread the gospel. You don't know who's going to accept it and who isn't. It's like casting a net out into the sea. Which when it is full, they drove to shore and sat down and gathered the good into the vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. Again, it says there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus saith unto them, Have ye understood all these things? They said unto him, Yea, Lord. Then said he unto them, Therefore every scribe which instructed unto the kingdom of heaven. The scribe is somebody in Old Testament times that, that copied the scripture so they would be real familiar with the Old Testament scripture. And here it says, Which is instructed into the kingdom of heaven. So now they have an understanding of what heaven's about. It's like a man that is a householder which bringeth forth out of his treasures things new and old. His disciples not only had an understanding of the Old Testament, but now they understood the New Testament as well. And it says, And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed thence. He left Galilee, or that area of Galilee, and when he was come into his own country, which would be uh, Nazareth in this case. He, he taught them in their synagogue, insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Who is this guy? This is somebody we do. But now he's, he's doing these mighty works, and he's, he's, he's preaching these, these things, and they, they didn't understand it. They said, Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brother, and James, and Joseph, and Simon, and Judas. We know his family. And his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath the man all these things? And they were offered in, and they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country, and in his own house. Jesus was preaching. These were people that knew him when he was little. They didn't understand how he could be the Christ, the Son of God. They didn't pay much attention to him. And it says, and he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. He did some mighty works, but not many. The people there didn't believe him. He was home. Each one of us have family members that are not Christians. They're some of the hardest people for us to talk to about the Lord. The ones that are really close to us. There's the reason. But we need to continue to try to, to let them know about Jesus Christ. Let them know how to become Christians and start living their life for the Lord. This time we're going to stand and sing number 666. It's uh, not the inside cover, but turn one page back. Jesus is coming soon. We know that he's coming. We don't know exactly when. But we need to be ready.
we need to have our bags packed. We need to have everything in the suitcase that we need to take with us. Faith, hope, love. The things that are important. And we need to be ready to, to head out when Jesus said it. When, when the Father tells Jesus, go and get your bride. Today's your wedding day. At this time, I stand and sing 600.